že sme mohli stáť. All right. Uh, so if I understand correctly, in my absence, you passed from classical to quantum field theory, right? So last time, how is it? So, and um, let me recall that at least locally in quantum field theory, the goal is to compute the partition function, which is an integral over the space of fields today and probably next time it will be, will be just some finite dimensional integrals of an expression which is an exponential of either 1 over h or maybe i over h of the um, classical action. Right? So that's the partition function. Here the integral is over the space of fields. Uh, well, or there are other expressions. One can add some function of fields inside and these are correlation functions so they depend on what you put in on this function g and they also depend on h. Um, so today we'll try to um, uh, develop the techniques for computing such things, which are known as Feynman's graphical calculus. You probably know or heard about it already, maybe or maybe not. Uh, so uh, let me recall that last time you were probably discussing, uh, even if such an integral exists, if, even if it converges, then typically it admits only an asymptotic expansion in terms of the parameter h. So what we will be doing today, we'll be computing um, various terms of this asymptotic expansion. But we start with very, very simple examples. So like our field theory for today and tomorrow for sure uh, or tomorrow, next week, is uh, field theory of dimension zero, which means that F is simply the space of maps from a point to a vector space V. So this is simply equal to V. Find a dimensional vector space. And we start with the uh, very simple expression for S of phi. Uh, so this will be a quadratic form on our so quadratic form on V. Uh, well, abstractly speaking, we can say that this means alpha is an element of the uh, symmetric, second symmetric power of the dual. Um, we can also write it in the following way. As a quadratic form of some operator. For that, we are fixing an auxiliary structure. The Euclidean scalar product on V. And with respect to the scalar product we have A, an operator on V, which is symmetric. So we can think of uh, this quadratic form as a quadratic form 
of this operator. So let me recall you a little bit of a linear algebra related to it because we will need it very soon. Um, <coughs> so the uh, a quadratic form allows you to identify V and V star. And uh, I think in our notation we would call the corresponding map alpha flat. So, um, so it works as follows. So alpha flat of phi should be an element uh, of V star. So, so there would be a canonical pairing uh, with other elements of V, and we simply define it as alpha of phi 1, phi 2. Right? So that's the standard way how you turn uh, vectors into covectors. So, um, so let's assume that. Uh, that alpha is a non-degenerate quadratic form, meaning that it has no kernel. So all this would also mean that here A is uh, a non-singular operator. So it has no kernel. So, uh, right. So then this map alpha flat is an isomorphism between V and V star. And it admits an inverse. Right, so then one can play the following game. So one can introduce, well, let me call it, I wanted to call it omega, but we usually call omega uh, symplectic forms. So, the, so let me call it you, you know, that's this uh, LaTeX, LaTeX letter warp pi, but some kind of curly omega. So, uh, so, 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 so then there is a, there is a symmetric form on V star, meaning a symmetric element of V, so that's the same as S2 V star star, right? Such that this or pi alpha flat phi 1, alpha flat phi 2 is equal to alpha phi 1 phi 2. Right? So I'm just, this, this more or less means I'm transporting. So alpha is on the one hand a quadratic form, and on the other hand it defines for you an isomorphism between V and V star. Therefore you can take alpha as a quadratic form and transport it back to, uh, <coughs> to V star. So, that's, so this var pi is alpha transported to V star using, using alpha again. Um, so of course, of course, this means that if you if you write it in terms of elements of V star, you get this formula. Flat minus one. So that's that's just the same formula, right? So here, phi 1, phi 2, i in v, and psi 1, psi 2, i in v star. Um, let me also 
write down um, yet another formula for it. But now in terms of the operator, uh, operator A and the Euclidean scalar product. So uh, you see here I, I'm identifying V and V star using, uh, using the quadratic form alpha. I can also identify V and V star using the scalar product, right? That's another quadratic form. Uh, so, so note that this is a different identification, right? So V and V star are isomorphic to each other in many ways. And now I've chosen a different identification of V and V star. Uh, so in this case, so the formula for this, uh, this quadratic form for pi, and now I, I really identify, I think of vectors in V star as being in V using this identification. So the formula will be as follows. It will be again a quadratic form of this type. Yeah, I'm never sure. Maybe this should it be with one half. Okay, about one half. I'm I'm not I'm not exactly sure. <coughs> and you would put here an operator a minus one. So you see here it it sounds like alpha and bar pi is just the same thing. If you use the identification of V and V star using the scalar product, it will turn out that the operator is replaced by its inverse. Uh, and why is that? Uh, you see, you, you can look at the right-hand side of this formula. You're using alpha, alpha minus one, and alpha minus one, right? So that's, that's, that's how it works. So that's why you will have an inverse of this uh, symmetric operator. Of course, A minus one is also a symmetric operator if A was symmetric. Right, okay, so much of linear algebra. However, this object will play a very, very important role in the Feynman calculus. So let me, Yeah, factor of half, yeah, I think that's, that's really doubtful, right? Uh, there, like there's factor half in both, right? Yeah, 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 right. Uh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, sure. Good point, yeah, let's get rid of it. No, no, there should be no. Yeah, yeah, alpha is A5, oh, yeah, very good, thank you. But you know, a huge jet lag, it takes a toll. So I would like to continue with a very simple elementary proposition just about the, um, about the integrals. Um, So let's assume that this uh, uh, quadratic form alpha is positive definite. So this is, uh, this is needed for existence of integrals. So then there is the following Gaussian integration formula that I would imagine you you would recognize more or less at once. So I take uh, I take this expression, exponential minus one over h s of phi, and I'm actually adding uh, a function, which is a, a linear function given by a pairing of uh, phi with some linear form, an element of v star. And such an integral is given by the following expression. So this is 2 pi h 
to the power d over 2 determinant of a to the power 1 half and here exponential h over 2 or pi of psi psi where d is a dimension of phi. Right. So this is uh, an elementary an elementary integral. I'll spend one minute on recalling you how it works. Uh, but this is one of the cornerstones of the uh, Feynman's technique uh, for perturbative quantum field theory. So uh, here perhaps uh, perhaps one test question. So I am taking the square root of determinant of A. Are we sure it makes sense? Sure, it's positive definite, so therefore A is symmetric. It has eigenvalues. All the eigenvalues are positive reals, so the determinant is a positive real, so the square root is reasonably well defined. Okay. Right. So what's the... Right, so what's the proof? Uh, essentially, we have in the exponential, we have the following expression 1 over 2h alpha phi phi minus psi phi. Um, so we rewrite it as 1 over 2h alpha phi phi, and here um, minus alpha, alpha flat minus one psi phi, I think. So now we, as usual, complete the square. We say that this is one over two h alpha phi minus h alpha flat minus 1 psi phi minus h alpha flat minus 1 psi uh, minus 1 over 2 h alpha h alpha flat minus 1 psi h alpha flat minus 1 psi. Uh, how did it, it, does it look reasonably correct? Uh, so uh, this expression is equal to minus h over 2 or pi of psi psi, right? Uh, now this implies that the uh, integral over v alpha phi phi plus psi phi uh, is equal to exponential h over 2 or pi psi psi. So that's the expression that we wanted um, times an integral. And here we, as usual in Gaussian integration, we can make a change of variables, denote this guy by phi tilde. So the measure is invariant under this shift. So it is d phi tilde. Right. 
right? Uh, over h. So that's that's a Gaussian integral. I think well, you probably know what they are, but also I think you discussed last time, right? Mm -hmm. What what are the values of Gaussian integrals? So this is equal to two pi h d over two over the determinant of a to the power one half. So which gives us the desired result. So that's a very, very simple, so that's a very simple formula, but it has interesting consequences. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the consequences of the, um, <laughs> of this integration formula. Let's say remark. Um, so let's do the following. Let's say uh, my element psi of V star is a sum from one to K of some real numbers times some other elements of V star. Of course, I can, I can apply my formula to any element psi, in particular to an element psi of this form. So uh, now I'll do the following. I'll take the integral on the left-hand side. And take partial derivatives of this integral with respect to the variables x1, xk. So this is a very, very well convergent integral, right? If alpha is positive definite, this means that one can easily differentiate under the integral. Everything will be fine. So this integral d phi exponential minus right. So I plan to differentiate this integral with respect to those uh, uh, with respect to those axes. And after that, I would like to put all the axes equal to zero. Well, then what's going to happen? Uh, this means that um, um, the exponential rate will be hit by each differentiation. It will produce the uh, linear form, psi i of phi. And after that, all the axes are equal to zero, so the exponential will disappear. So this will give me a Gaussian integral. Uh, and here the exponential will be replaced by a product of linear functions, psi i of phi. So this will be an integral with, the, with this exponential kernel times a polynomial, which is actually a product of linear forms, right? So that's, uh, that's just the definition. On the other hand, of course, right, I know the answer for this integral. So that's the answer for this integral. So this is equal to 2 pi i h to the power d over 2, determinant of a to the power one half d over dx1 d over dxk. Now this exponential h over two or pi psi psi. And again, we should put x equal to zero.
Well, let me let me write the answer for this expression, and then we discuss kind of why this is true. Um, but maybe first of all, okay, let's let me rewrite. Let me rewrite it once or twice. Right, so we have these two pi h to the power d over two over determinant of a one half. Here we have this differential operator. And here let's simply consider the power series for the exponential. So this is one of m factorial h over two to the power m or pi psi psi to the power m. Right. Now uh, recall that psi is actually a linear function of axis. Right? So in fact those powers of war pi, they are polynomials in x of homogeneous degree to m, right? Because we have two psi's in one of them. So this is polynomial in x of degree equal to 2m. And here we have k derivatives and, and then we put x equals zero. So this means that the following two situations may occur. So this is actually zero if k is odd, right? Because uh, all the polynomials here are of even degree in x. So it's impossible to differentiate k times and then put x equal to zero and get a non-zero result if k is odd. Uh, and if k is even, then the situation is more interesting. So if k is even as the situation is more interesting, then the we have we have this prefactor. So we have we have the derivative, uh, and then we have h over 2 to the power k over 2 or pi psi psi to the power k over 2 1 over k over 2 factorial and then we put x equal to 0 if k is even right so there is only one term in this exponential sum uh, which would possibly produce a non-zero answer, or maybe not. Um, all right. Now let me let me write down um, an answer, and we discuss why it is true. Of course, the prefactor survives. So this h to the power k over 2 survives. And now uh, I would like to write something interesting. Uh, so this will be so this will be sum over certain elements of the permutation group SK, uh, and here will be a product over I, and uh, I will discuss what it is of four pi psi I 
psi sigma i. So let me first explain the expression on the right and then uh, say why is it true. Uh, so, um, so what are pairings? So we are looking at the elements of the permutation group pairing or sometimes people say matching. If on the one hand sigma square is one, so uh, it's an involution. And on the other hand, sigma has no fixed points. So, um, so roughly speaking, it works as follows. Suppose we take some even k, right? We can only do it for k even. For instance, here k is equal to six. And um, so this is an example of a pairing. Uh, so this means that our set uh, of k elements is split into k over two pairs and the permutation is simply permuting those pairs. In other words, we can say we know that permutations are products of cycles. So here all the cycles have lengths exactly two. Right? So, so these are elements of the permutation group which are products of uh, cycles of lengths two or of transpositions. Right. So, uh, so we are summing over all such pairings or over all such matchings. And what we are doing here, so this is actually a product uh, over the set of pairs or over the set of those transpositions or cycles of which sigma consists. And we are taking here xi with numbers which form a pair. Okay. So this is I sigma of i pairs, so the product of a pairs. So this is well defined. It doesn't matter in which order the elements of a pair uh, come into, uh, into this set because war pi is a symmetric bilinear form. Right? So it doesn't matter whether sigma i or i come first. Um, Perhaps before talking of why is it true, let me um, give you a simplest example. So suppose we want to com compute uh, such an integral where we have four, a product of four linear forms. So psi 1 of phi, psi 2 of phi, psi 3 of phi, psi 4 of phi. Now the claim is that there will be this uh, standard prefactor to the power k over 2. Here k is equal to 4, so times h square. And uh, there will be sums of those matchings or pairings. So in fact, in this case, there are three of them. So that's 1. That's two, and that's three, right? So there are three matchings. So here this means that there will be warp pi, psi one, psi two, warp pi, psi three, psi four, plus warp pi, psi one, psi four, warp pi, psi two, psi three, plus warp pi, 
psi 1, psi 3, or pi psi 2, psi 4. So this, uh, uh, so this, these pictures that I draw for matchings, they're actually very primitive Feynman graphs. So that's the first, that the first occurrence of whatever some kind of these are graphs, right? So they have vertices, they have edges, and these are the simplest Feynman graphs. And what we see, we see that some integral, some very simple integral, admittedly, right? A Gaussian integral with a product of some linear forms, it's represented as some kind of standard prefactor times the sum of uh, final graphs of some expressions which you can produce by some rules from a graph. Here the rule is very simple. Once I have an edge which connects two points, I take the corresponding linear form and I compute the quadratic form on these two vectors, right? So the, it, it looks as an algorithm. So uh, maybe I should say that uh, sometimes the equality, so the equality of the left-hand side and of the right-hand side, is called Wick's theorem. So this is, of course, some elementary statement, but um, so this, this would be simplest simplest final graphs. So the expressions in the kind of physics language, the expressions warp pi, psi one, psi two, would be called propagators. Uh, so in the physics lingua, uh, what, what we're having now is uh, representation of this integral as a sum of products of propagators. So we'll see in more realistic examples of field theory why do physicists um, call it this way, but so that's how it looks now. Now let's see, uh, do we understand, whether we understand why, <coughs> why this is true? Now, uh, after all, this was the result of some elementary differentiation. So we need to differentiate with respect to x1 and so on, xk, uh, this expression, right? So uh, let's, uh, let's just see how it works, right? So for instance, you apply the derivative d over dx1 to this expression, right? So you, you have to pick one of the factors, warp pi, right? And uh, you have to differentiate one of the size. Then eventually you get another, another psi in the same expression. You need to differentiate the corresponding, one of the corresponding x's, right? Because you need to kill all the x's. So this means that you will have to use one of your other differential operators to differentiate it, right? So you will have warp pi of psi one times some other psi. Now you take the next warp pi. You have to, for instance, you use your x2 if it was not used in the first instance. You differentiate it, and then in a similar fashion, you would have to find its partner, right? So it's clear that in the end, we do get products of this type. Uh, the question is how many times each product comes up. So what's the combinatorial factor? So how many times uh, a given matching comes up on the right-hand side? Uh, well, let's try to work our combinatorics, right? So uh, first of all, of course, there is this uh, k over two factorial ways 
to get it, right? Because uh, we, could, we could use this one or next one or whatever, right? Any, any, we, we could have used any of them in any order. So this would kill uh, k over two factorial. Now what about two to the power k over two? Right, exactly. You, 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 can always, you can always switch between the, um, between, the two, uh, uh, between the two elements of the pair. You can, for instance, if it turns out to be Xi1, Xi2, you could have chosen first X1 and then X2, or first X2 and then X1. So for each of these warp eyes, you will have two ways to get it. And this gives two to the power K over two. So this is fortunate and this is somehow a generic phenomenon you can say. So this, uh, all these funny combinatorial factors cancel. And actually you get a sum of all the matchings with coefficient exactly one. Which is certainly a nice effect. We'll see an analog of this effect in a more difficult situation at the next hour, but there, there will be still some, some factors, but here those factors turn out to be all equal one uh, if, we, if we have this one over two and one over k over two factorial that we, we kind of stored from before. Right, um, so do you need a more formal proof? I think probably, right, that's, that's combinatorics that if you want, you can work out yourself. Uh, so this is a very, very, as I say, it's a simple result, but that's a very beautiful and very significant result for what follows. Um, let, me, let me write down the expression that we, we want to discuss after the break. So this was a kind of preparation. For computing a more, more complicated integral. So we'll be thinking of a partition function. Um, so this is z of h. And I'll choose s of phi in the following form. So again, there will be a one over two alpha phi phi. So let's say alpha non-degenerate and positive definite. And for some reason I will not add by subtract from it something. And <coughs> this something will be all the following form. So remember before I was uh, subtracting some linear function, right? Uh, in the previous calculation. In the elementary calculation we had, we subtracted psi of phi. So here I will subtract the sum over R from one to a priori infinity, maybe in practice some finite sum. And here one over R factorial, GR alpha R of phi phi phi. R times, where the notation is as follows. So alpha R is uh, a symmetric tensor of 
degree R. So it's a multilinear symmetric, completely symmetric multilinear form. Now linearity is R. Before it was like bilinear or linear, now arbitrary multilinear form. So you see, I start with one, which means that linear forms are in. Even quadratic forms are in. Then we'll later discuss what to do with it. Uh, and uh, up to any degree, even who knows, maybe up to infinity, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, and GR are what is called, so these are parameters, what is called coupling constants. So in fact, here it's not quite true. It's not a function, now it's not a function in H. It's a function in H, G1, G2, and so on, in, uh, in, 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 the, in those coupling, coupling constants. And uh, we'll think of it for a moment. So uh, there will be several ways how we can think about Z. So what, what, what is it element of? And uh, let me think about it for a moment as a formal power series in those G's. In practice, this means that uh, I'm supposed to decompose the exponential into a power series with respect to those G's and to compute a coefficient in front of each power of G's. So that's, that's, that's at the moment, that's just a definition of the, uh, uh, of the left hand side. Of course, if I choose G's and alphas of some particular sign, then it might happen that such an integral converges, and, but we'll discuss it a bit later. So at the moment, we'll be just concerned after the break with trying to compute this integral. And the idea is, again, to use some kind of combinatorics, but now the combinatorics will be significantly more involved, right? So this was just the combinatoric of matchings, it will be now combinatorics of arbitrary Feynman graphs. So we'll see it after the break. All right, so should we continue? Um, Pavel asked me to remind you that uh, if I understand correctly, you agreed that today there will be at 2 o'clock an extra lecture about dualities at, but in Battelle, right? Well, wait, was it Battelle? I don't think we agreed on the place. Yes. Ah, okay, so it will be, I think he, he, he hasn't found uh, a place here, so it will be. Uh, I vaguely recall, like, at 2 o'clock, right? 2 o'clock. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so today at 2 o'clock. Right, so uh, we continue with a big theorem. Well, we can call it Feynman theorem. I'm not sure that Feynman was thinking about it in that way, but um, so let's, let's put it like that. So uh, the integral that we are interested in, um, so this integral with S of phi of this form. <coughs> so this is equal to, as before, the standard prefactor And um, here there will be a relatively complicated expression. So first of all, this is a sum of sequences of uh, non-negative integers and one and two and so on, uh, where Only finite number of terms are 
are non-zero. So they are almost all zero, so there is just some finite number of them which are non-zero. So these are infinite sequences, but um, now, um, uh, th there is the next sum. So that's the sum of, uh, let me call it GN. So these are graphs. With N1 univalent, N2 two valent, N3 three, three valent, and so on. Vertices. And uh, for each graph, we have one, so a combinatorial factor, which, which is one over the uh, order of the automorphism group of this graph. We'll discuss in some detail what this group is. Um, now, h to the power number of edges minus number of vertices of gamma. Now the product of R, GR to the power NR. So the G's are those coupling constants. And finally, F gamma, which we still need to define. This is the this is a number called the Feynman amplitude. Of gamma. So this is this is some number, let's say, in general a complex number. Right, so that's the structure of the answer. You see that's a little bit similar to what we saw. Uh, at the previous hour. So an integral is some prefactor times the sum over graphs of some numbers, right? So now here it's of the same structure. So these two sums, they create for us a sum over graphs with different numbers of vertices of different valency. So then for each of the graphs, we have, some, we have some factor which is a product of our parameters to some power. So the power is determined by the um, structure of the graph. So the uh, exponents of those g's, they correspond to the to number of vertices of a given valency. So the power of h is also expressed in terms of the graph combinatorics, so there is an important combinatorial factor, uh, the order of the group of automorphisms of gamma. And then finally, there is this mysterious Feynman amplitude. So I should explain, before trying to prove it, I, I should explain what is this and what is that. So let me, let me start with the automorphisms of gamma. So what is a graph, right? Or Feynman graph, sometimes people say Feynman graph, but Feynman graphs are just graphs. So what's a graph, right? We have uh, uh, vertices and edges, so we have two sets. So at the moment, our graphs are non-oriented. And to each edge, we assign two vertices, right, where the endpoints of the edge are. Right? So there is, there, there, is, there is a map from E gamma to V gamma times V gamma. Um, what would be examples, right? So let me draw a couple of examples that will be of interest for us. Uh, 
for instance, this is a graph with two trivalent vertices and three edges. Uh, another graph with two trivalent vertices and three edges, for instance, would be something like this. Right, so we can admit loops. Um, uh, usually, uh, one of the uh, uh, interesting combinatorial invariants, or one of the ways to encode a graph, is to write its adjacency matrix. So you, you know what it is, right? So we introduce, at the moment, our vertices or edges are not enumerated. So if you want to build an adjacency matrix, you introduce an order or enumeration on the set of vertices. And so the... adjacency matrix. Uh, and what you do, uh, you are writing at the uh, matrix element ij, the number of edges which connect directly I, the vertex i to the vertex j. For instance, here you have, uh, uh, you have uh, two vertices, so this will be two by two matrix. For instance, I can choose this one to be one and the other one to be two. Uh, so then there are no loops. So on the diagonal, I would have zero. And off diagonal here, I will have three and three. So the adjacency matrix is by definition symmetric, right? Because we have non-oriented edges, as many connect i to j as j to i. So here the adjacency matrix will be one, 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 right? Okay. Um, now, what's the definition of automorphisms of gamma? Uh, let me define it in the following uh, funny way. Let me introduce one more set, E1 half gamma. So this will be the set of half edges of gamma. So I split every edge into two halves. And I obtain a bigger set. So the set exactly twice bigger than E gamma. So let me consider, let me define automorphisms of gamma as a set of elements, how should I call them? G, H, H, in this symmetric. in the symmetric group of this, uh, or the permutations of half edges, such that H preserves such that H preserves vertices of gamma and edges of gamma. So uh, what does it mean? For instance, um, let's uh, let's think about uh, let's think about this uh, this graph. Uh, so what what you can do? Uh, so this is a permutation of half edges. Uh, for instance, if I if I send this half edge to that half edge, right? So then. Uh, if, since I want to preserve edges, right, the other half has to be, has to be sent here, right? So there is, there is no other, other way. Now, since I want to, uh, since I want to preserve vertices, uh, so this guy is sent there. Now, what about this one? It has to go either here or there to be connected to the same vertex. So these are permutations which uh, keep the edges whole and keep the vertices whole. Right? So each vertex is sent to a vertex with the half edges uh, adjoined to it and uh, each edge is sent to a complete edge. So it doesn't cut edges, it doesn't destroy vertices.
vertices. Sure, it can permute vertices. Yeah, it can permute vertices. And it can, whatever, it can send an edge to some other edge. It can send a vertex to some other vertex. But it doesn't take a vertex and sends part of it to one vertex and another part to another vertex. So it, well, it preserves balances? Or? Yeah, it preserves balances, certainly, certainly, yes. As a consequence, it preserves balances. Uh, so uh, let's do the following. Let's compute those, or let, let, let's say what those groups are in these two examples. And then after that, I, I will show you the general recipe, how the groups look like. Um, so um, so what, what's going, what, what will be, so what will be the group, the automorphism group here? What can we do? So for this, for this graph. So we exchange the halves and uh, in each half we can so exchanging the vertices, so this would give us some Z2 factor, right? And what about like... And we can permute, uh, uh, we can permute the half edge to the edges, but uh, since uh, permuting it on one side determines yeah. the other side, then it's like we only have this three. Right, so this will be like permuting edges, which is the symmetric group in three elements, or permuting vertices, which is the symmetric group in two elements, which is the same as Z2. Um, so what about, what about this thing? So for sure there is, uh, right, the loops. Why, why do I bother about half edges? Because if you only think about edges, it's not so clear whether exchanging the two things means something or not. So if, if I think about half edges, it's clear that to each loop, I should associate a Z2 subgroup, right? So I have Z2 times Z2. Now, uh, what about the vertex? I can exchange the vertices, that also makes Z2. But if I'm really interested in the group structure, of course this Z2 will be exchanging the two copies. So it's gonna be a semi-direct product, right? Because when, when, when I exchange the vertices, the loops are exchanged. So this means there is a non-trivial action of this gadget on that gadget. So these are examples of um, of automorphism groups. Um, so in general, the structure of the answer is, uh, uh, the structure of the answer is as follows. Let me, uh, let me write it down for you. So, uh, for each pair, of distinct vertices. Let me say i is more than j. I take some enumeration of vertices. So uh, let me call this adjacent symmetrix, let's say A. Uh, so, so there will be a permutation group S A I J, right? That's 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 like this S3 we have there. So we have between one and two some number of edges, and of course we can commute them, right? This preserves the structure of the, gra of the graph. Now, uh, it's slightly more complicated um, when we think of loops. So here I, I want to encode, I, wa I want to think of some groups which correspond to the, to the loops. Uh, so here there will be, uh, so here, how is it? Maybe you can um, uh, write. So for so for each loop, so there will be a Z two factor, 
right? But then I can also exchange the loops. And, uh, and, and this permutation group, I think it acts on Z2s, right? Because it exchanges different copies of Z2s. Uh, so that's not, not, not like here. This, this would be an example of this sort. So suppose I, suppose I have two loops at the same vertex. So for each loop, I have a Z2. And I also have a Z2 exchange in the loops. So it acts similar to what I had before. Right, so that's so that's that's uh, uh, that's part of the structure of the answer, right? But up to now we didn't we didn't permute any vertices, so this should be. Let me call it gamma v. So that's the subgroup of the permutation group of the vertices. So which permutations of vertices are allowed? The Certainly, they should preserve valences. But perhaps more precisely, they should preserve the adjacency matrix. Right? So these are permutations of vertices, preserving. Preser so you, you map, you, 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 cha you change your enumeration, and you get the same matrix. Right? So, that's, so this means you get the same graph. So, that's, uh, so this, is, this, is a complete, this is a complete answer. Well, gamma v perhaps is a bad notation. What should it be? H, H v. So uh, it's actually uh, uh, the structure of the answer makes it quite easy to compute uh, to compute the uh, um, number of elements, the cardinality of the uh, automorphism group. So hot gamma is equal to, well, you, uh, you have to know the cardinality of this group. So that's, there is no, no way out. But after that, you have product i smaller than j, aij factorial times product of i, 2 to the power aii. AII factorial. Right. So it's um <coughs> yeah, it's a very concrete formula. Okay. Uh, very well. So let me let me speak a little bit about this F gamma. So what is F gamma? So we're given, we're given a graph. For instance, let me, for example, take this graph. Uh, let's first consider the set of vertices. So here we have 
two three valent vertices. Uh, to a vertex of valency r, we associate, so here the valency is equal to three, uh, we associate uh, the uh, um, multilinear form, so in this case alpha three, and let me recall that alpha three is an element of the uh, uh, symmetric, symmetric tensors of V star. Right? So we consider all our uh, all our vertices, say univalent vertices. We have uh, n one of them. We have some two valent vertices. We have some three valent vertices possibly. And so on. But this is a finite, finite tensor product because we have some finite number of uh, vertices in total. So we consider this space. And in this space, uh, we have an element which is simply equal to alpha one and so on alpha one. So here, right, we had something which, which was in our S and so on. Here we had alpha three, alpha three, and so on. So we have a vector inside this huge, inside this huge tensor product. Now, um, so that's, so that's what we associate to the vertex set of the graph. So to the vertex set of the graph, we associate a huge vector space and a vector in this huge vector space. So a similar thing happens for the set of edges. Uh, so to every edge, so this is relatively boring. So to every edge, we associate a space S2V. So the symmetric power of V. And inside it, we take an element which corresponds to our var pi, right? Var pi is a symmetric bilinear form on V star, so the element of S2V. Right. So um, we get as I say, a huge vector space and a vector inside it. And we have another huge vector space and a vector inside it. In principle, it might be even more convenient to think of those vector spaces as subspaces in the product of a big number of these, right? Just S to V is a subspace of V tensor V. And here in similar fashion, in a big number of V stars. Actually, what's the number of, uh, of elements here? So we take here each edge, and to an edge we, we associate V tensor V. So, so the number here is the number of half edges, right? What about this story? We take a vertex, and to each vertex, we associate a number of V stars which corresponds to its valency. Well, what's the, uh, uh, what's the sum of all the valences? It's also the number of half edges, right? Because to each vertex, we can associate the half edges which are attached to it. So this is also the number of half edges. So actually, uh, here is a product of some big number of Vs, and here is a product of some big number of V stars, and actually these two numbers are equal to each other. Now, um, A graph 
uh, defines a pairing between these two spaces. So, um, right, let me show it in our example here. Right, so here is our example and we have V star times V star times V star that corresponds to the vertex one times V star times V star times V star and this corresponds to the vertex two. Now we have edges, let me also enumerate them one, two, three, so we have V tens of V, V tens of V, V tens of V. So these are the edges one, two, and three. So what does, uh, what does the graph do? It tells me that the edges one, two, and three are attached to the vertex one in this order and I take pairings between V and V star, right? V and V star, they have canonical pairings, and I take pairings in this order. Now, the other end of the first edge is attached to vertex two, and similar for other edges, and so the graph defines for me this wiring diagram, which tells me how to pair Vs and V stars. So the graph gives a appearing between V star to the power one half E one half gamma and V to the power one half gamma. So this pairing does depend on the graph. So there will be like, for other, to other graphs, we would associate other pairings. So these elements do not depend on the graph, right? So this element only depends on what kind of vertices and how many vertices you have and on their valences. So this element only depends on the number of edges. The pairing depends on the graph in a significant way and <coughs> so F gamma, uh, so let me denote this vector in some way. Uh, yeah, I, I don't quite know. So let's say, uh, right, what, what should it be? Uh, so let's say, so it corresponds to vertices. So, so let's say V gamma and this element is, uh, Yeah, this is V, and this element is E gamma. So we take V gamma and E gamma and pair them with the pairing which depends on gamma. But the main dependence on gamma is here. Only very weak dependencies in V and E. So V and E are more or less the same once the number of edges and the valences of vertices are the same, but this, this is not at all the same. So these, these are just numbers now. All right. Okay. <coughs> so, um, so let's, uh, let's discuss a little bit the um, proof of this statement. So why, um, so why Feynman's theorem is true? Um, mm. 
So we want to compute the formal expansion of this, uh, of this expression. Um, perhaps I rewrite it in the following way. And here I, I, I'm supposed to put the uh, exponential of 1 over h s prime of phi. So let me recall that s prime of phi, this is a sum over r, 1 over r factorial gr alpha r of phi. So alpha r of phi is an r linear form. So, <coughs> so now this is the product of exponentials for each r and I decompose each of the exponentials in a power series. So I have d phi. Um, maybe one more move before, before we proceed. So let's do a rescaling of phi, right? So let's say phi goes to h to the power one half phi. Right, so this will kill this will kill the power here, and it will be easier then for the uh, for the counting. So this gives the factor h to the power d over two from the measure. Honestly, I should introduce a new uh, a new name for the variable, but I think it would be too cumbersome. So minus one half alpha of five. And here what's going to happen, uh, so I will have a sum over r, 1 over r factorial, gr. And now what's going to happen with those h's? Uh, so here there will be a factor of h to the power r over 2. And here I will have minus 1. So minus 1 is this, is this minus 1. R of phi, right? <coughs> now, by definition of the formal power series, I can now expand my exponentials in a power series and exchange the, the, the series with the integral. So that, that's more or less the definition of what it means to, to look at it formally. So um, I'll have a sum over n's which are equal to n1, n2, and so on. Uh, here I'll have a product over r, uh, 1 over nr factorial, 1 over r factorial gr to the power nr, right? Uh, h to the power n r r over 2 minus 1. And here will be an integral d phi exponential minus 1 half alpha phi phi times the product over r alpha r of phi to the power to the power n r, right? So that's so that's what happens. <coughs> now let's uh, so let's talk about these integrals, right? So what do these integrals So these are the integrals of polynomials, right? So for for each set of n's which is a finite finite set Right, so almost all of its elements being zero. 
so this is a this is a polynomial of some homogeneous degree and we want to compute this kind of integral so that's something that we were computing before <coughs> right so integral d phi alpha phi phi and here we take a product over r of r of phi to the power n r, right? So we want to know what this, uh, what this thing is. Well, we know that this is 2 pi to the power d over 2 over determinant of a 1 half, right? Now, so this is, uh, so, 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 so this is a polynomial and we want, of course, we can always represent it as sum of products of... So both products have the same index? Or am I reading this wrong? Oh, yeah, as you like. You, you, you prefer some other index? Sure, they, they will, of course, so they, the, this kind... And all in this is one thing, or...? R, alpha R, and R. Yeah, but the second... So I'm just meaning there's no oh, difference oh, oh. from this outer. Okay, in, in principle, it, they, they come from splitting, okay. so the same product, but I wanted to separate the part with the integral. Uh, if you want, I can, I can here call it S. But uh, right, well, what happened? I uh, took these exponentials and I expanded each of them in a power series. Right, and uh, that's 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 what I that's what I got. Okay. Right. Right. So here there were there were there were those uh, tensors, uh, and I uh, I need to integrate them. So this is the uh, this is a product of polynomials. Of course, each polynomial I can represent as sum of products of linear functions, right? Uh, products of linear functions, I know how we, to integrate. So let me, let me write down the answer. So the, so the answer here uh, should be... Uh, um, Sum over matchings, and uh, so yes. Yeah, so let me put it here: f uh, matchings, let's say sigma, and here I will write f gamma of sigma, where f gamma. So let me recall how it worked. So uh, I now have uh, those tensors alpha one, so on, alpha one, and one of them, and so on. So that's my element V gamma, right? So this means that I have here N one linear functions, then two times N two linear functions, and so on. Right? So I have all those linear functions and let me draw them in the following way. So, so these, are, these are the half edges emanating from each vertex and each half edge corresponds to a linear function, right? And here implicitly there is a sum of, uh, of those uh, linear functions with some coefficients which are determined by the tensor, right? Now uh, I need to integrate those linear functions. So uh, what does it mean? The integration, we know, it produces uh, a matching of half edges, right? So it produces a matching of half edges, something of this sort, so that's a matching. And to each matching, I should associate uh, the product of those var pi's, right? Var pi is evaluated on the on these two linear functions. 
So that's exactly the procedure that I described to you before, right? So each edge would get the uh, var pi, a copy of var pi. So this will be an element E gamma. And evaluating var pi's on the, uh, on the linear functions corresponding to half edges, this will be the pairing between these two elements, which, is, which corresponds to the graph. So that's literally speaking, when we, when we perform this integral and use the Wick's theorem, that's, that, that, that's what we are actually getting. So I would suggest as an exercise just to do it for, uh, for this configuration that we saw already. Uh, so you will have a product of this uh, trilinear form times another trilinear form. So I can write them down. So each of them, this alpha three of phi, I can write it as uh, sum over i, j, k, alpha three i, j, k, phi i, phi j, phi k whether these are elementary linear forms corresponding to some choice of basis in my space V. And, and then we can simply check that uh, actually uh, the corresponding terms are exactly of the form that I, I described. So, um, right. Um, so that, that's basically how those Feynman amplitudes come about from combination of the Wick's theorem and, uh, and, this, uh, uh, and the fact that we want to integrate products of multilinear forms. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the last question which remains is the question of, uh, uh, is the question of the prefactor, right? So, uh, so there are two sources for the prefactor. One source are those factorials here. And another source is the number of matchings which produce the same graph, right? Here, I, I said that there would be a graph which corresponds to a matching. But it may happen that many matchings give you the same graph, right? So, uh, so, these are, so these are factors in the denominator. And here, there would be some factors in the numerator. So we need to compute the following. So this is the product over R, one over an R factorial, and here one over R factorial to the power n R, right? And times number of matchings uh, which give, uh, give a given graph that give a given graph gamma. Um, so um, now let's see what is this or rather what's the, what's the inverse, what's the inverse of it. Uh, I claim that this is uh, an order of some uh, uh, cardinality of some natural subgroup of the permutation group of half edges. So this is equal to, so this number is one, one of a cardinality of, uh, of a group. And this group G so these are elements of permutations of half edges, which do what? So they preserve, they preserve vertices, right? So what, what, what do they do, right? They're allowed to, so these are permutations of, uh, so these are permutations of vertices of valency R, and these are 
permutations of half edges emanating from each vertex of valency R. But they, they don't preserve edges, right? So these are, this is a subgroup. So that's the subgroup which preserves vertices. Um, recall that automorphisms of gamma, that's a subgroup which preserves vertices and preserves edges. So automorphisms of gamma is a subgroup of this gadget, which on top of it preserves edges. So um, in fact, what happens, um, so uh, um, how is it? This, this place is always like kind of tricky. So I, I want to claim that uh, this is exactly uh, so the the so the claim claim is claim is that. Uh, um, so the cardinality of G is exactly is exactly the uh, the degree of the automorphism group of gamma or. Uh, the other way around, if we exchange them, that the quotient of this guy by that guy will be the number of matchings. Um, why is it true? So, uh, in fact, uh, an automorphism of gamma would be uh, a subgroup preserving the graph, and meaning that if we start acting by G, on the matchings, so this would be the symmetry group, so this would be the stabilizer group of the, of the given matching. Now acting by G, uh, uh, acting by G on, the, on the matchings, we are producing di all the different matchings which give us gamma. The stabilizer of a matching is automorphisms of gamma. So therefore, the number of matchings, so that's the cardinality of the quotient space, Oh, and this is exactly the uh, quotient of the uh, cardinality of the big group by the cardinality of the stabilizer. So, um, so, and this is because G acts transitively on matchings given gamma and the automorphism of gamma is the stabilizer for this action. Right. All right, so let me, sorry for being over time, let me take two more minutes uh, to finish, to, to, to look at, at, uh, at the power of H, right? Remember I claimed that the power of H is the uh, number of edges minus the number of vertices. So um, we take a sum and R, R over two minus one. <coughs> so this is equal to the sum over R and R times R over two minus sum over R and R. So this sum is clearly the number of vertices because that's just an, uh, the, uh, the sum of numbers of uh, vertices of each valency, right? So the total sum is the number of vertices. Now what about this expression? So I take for each vertex, I take R over two where R is the valency, right? So this is uh, half the number of half edges. So I have R half edges emanating 
from each vertex, and I divide it by 2. So this is equal 1 half of the number of half edges. However, every edge consists of two half edges, right? So this means that half of the number of half edges is the number of edges. So that's a bit counterintuitive, right? Because you would think it would be the other way around. But so this is the number of edges. So that's why the uh, power of h that we encounter in the sum is h bar to the power number of edges minus the number of vertices. So, um, so let me know whether this part of the proof uh, is convincing. Please think of, think of it and check whether it's really true. Uh, but otherwise, we, we've completed the proof. And I think it's a high time we stop for today. And,